I believe that you have to build belief. Belief is like, there's an after school special belief where the mom says, believe in yourself, and that's all great. But there's also a built belief. Like for me, I came from a bad place. How I build belief is through the daunting tasks I put myself through. So that's proof positive that I can. So it correlates. And that's how this piece of kid I once thought I was built belief by saying, hmm, I was in three hell weeks. I went to ranger school. I tried out for Delta Selection. Whenever you think you can can't. Confidence comes from the thing that you built. You must build belief. You must build confidence. It can't be like, hey, I'm going to knock that shit out. You got to look over here and say, I can knock that shit out. It's belief and it's built on what you put in to yourself. Need motivation? Watch your top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because in my first business, I quit on my business partner. I struggled to keep going. I was making 300 bucks a month and felt like a complete failure. And the thing that saved me, that pulled me up, was studying the stories of famous entrepreneurs. I got the motivation from them. I also got the strategies of what to do next so that I can go off and achieve my dreams. And quite honestly, I still need the stories today myself to continue my motivation to take it to the next level. So today, let's learn from one of the best, David Goggins, and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two is be authentic. There's like this allure that you have where it's with anything, any type of keynote from David Goggins, any type of video from David, podcast. What, what do you think it is? What, what do you think it is that attracts people to your content? I think it's my take it or leave it kind of mentality where I don't really think about your feelings. I don't really care about what you think or what you think about me or if you're soft, if you're weak, if you're hard, if you're an alpha, if whatever the hell you are, I just don't really care. And I'm going to say what I believe is going to get you better. It may make you pissed off at me in the interim, but in the long term, if you really think about what I'm saying, I'm saying things to you that I had to listen to and, you know, tell myself. And it's just sometimes hard truth sucks. Rule number three is train your brain. What I'm most impressed with is training the brain. Would you say to those of us that are listening and watching today that every time you would get through a day of hell week or just a day of training, whatever it was, that the mind does almost like a muscle, the voice does change and you can train the negative voice? The mind, as you know, is not a muscle, but it almost is. Yeah. It really is. Right. If you stop going to the gym, right. your muscles will atrophy. Yeah. If you stop training your brain, the same thing will happen. So I learned to callous over. I did 4,030 pull-ups in 17 hours to break the Ginsburg World's records. Your hands become very calloused. Callouses protect your hands. Mm -hmm. What I learned to do is through mental hardening is callous my mind. Mm -hmm. I had a victim's mentality. I learned to callous my mind over the victim's mentality. And you have to be willing to put yourself in very difficult situations at all times to be able to do that. So my big takeaway of life is if you're constantly taking the easy way out, you never go callous your mind. I was at MIT. They called a person like me to MIT to speak to some of the biggest head guys on the planet. Oh yeah, these guys. Brains. Oh brains. <laughs> so I was on this. I was on this panel, and I, you know I talk about it in my introduction of my book, and all these brainiacs were there, and they called me in. Like you say, I didn't go to college for this, mm -hmm. but they're all theorists. Mm -hmm. I'm a practitioner. That's why I asked you. Absolutely. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. And so they're all sitting there, all these great smart minds from MIT are asking these brilliant guys questions. I ain't say a word. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm intimidated. Right. But I know that half of what they're saying is wrong. Because mm -hmm. what these theorists did, even though they're very smart, what these theorists did was they took a poll on normal people. And this is what you get. Of course. This is what we cannot do. So theorists love telling you what we cannot do. Mm -hmm. This is what we can do. Right. So one person in the crowd asked me a question, why aren't you saying anything? I said, pretty much, I disagree with almost everything up here on this panel because I'm living proof that everything that they're pretty much saying is not true. That's right, because you were an average person. I was a below. Below, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Below average person. I was a chameleon living in life who right. could barely get by. Mm -hmm. So I know that they were taking the normal mindset of people they weren't talking about the one percenters, mm -hmm. the people who want it like there's no tomorrow. Mm -hmm. 
And so that's what I started realizing was we have theorists and we have practitioners. So what's in my book is from going into the, to the dungeon. Mm -hmm. And when you're in those points where you want to quit and not quitting and seeing how the mind starts to operate in those moments of fear, mm -hmm. anxiety, self-doubt, insecurities. Mm -hmm. right. And that's where you learn to fix it. Yeah. You don't fix it in 72 degree weather. Right. Drinking a milkshake, watching TV. You mm. fix it yes. by going into the environment. Rule number four, accept who you are. The problem that most of us have is we think that we're all alone. We think that we're the only ones going through all this stuff. I thought it. Most of us think that if you're fat, which I was fat for a while, you think you're the only fat person in the world. Your, your vision becomes very narrowed. And what happened to me was, all I did was I peeled back. I peeled back and I was able to get on top of a mountaintop in my head. And when you're high on that mountain, you have a great, you have a great vantage point. And I was able to look down at the world and we are, all of us are jacked up. Some of us hide it better than others, but we're all jacked up. And once you realize that, you know, you got to come out of your shell. You got to accept who you are. You got to accept the demons that life gave you that maybe you gave you, whoever gave them to you, you gotta accept that. You gotta be able to look them in the mirror, look them in the eye and say, okay, I'm gonna start fixing these things. But if you think that you're by yourself, the reality of your life becomes very, very horrible. And you're not, we are all jacked up. And once you realize that, man, you just, it's like, whatever. You don't, you don't even look at the crowd anymore. You look at your own race, you do your own race, you do your own thing and you finally find out who you're supposed to be in this life. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five is start your day with a run. What does a morning look like for you at the moment? Have you got a routine of some kind? Yes, I run every single morning. So that's What time are you up? When are you waking up? I'm up about five, five thirty. So every morning it starts with a run. And that's because that's the one thing I hate to do more than anything in the world. So that's like my cup of coffee. And I'm all about armoring yourself. So the second you leave your house and the second you open your phone, the second you do any of that, you are now letting in poison and cancer. So I make sure a lot of things you can't avoid. So as I get up, I start to armor plate my mind and body. Like a person's going to war, you put your body armor on. That's what I'm doing on that run. I'm waking up and I'm giving myself all this armor. So when I come out in the world, now look at that phone, I'm ready. I'm not waking up late. I'm not rushing around. I'm not disorganized because I know I'm going to get hit in the mouth. There's, a, there's an art to getting hit in the mouth. And that is why these things are important. You have to wake up and you have to give yourself belief. You have to give yourself confidence. So that, it starts with that run. Rule number six is take accountability. You say that when you're living in hell, the only way to find your way out is to confront the devil himself. You know, who, who was right. that devil for you? It took several years for me to figure out who the devil was. And the devil was my father. The devil was my father. But what I didn't put and never finished was the devil really was me. So what happened was I put all this blame and trust me, my father and a lot of people had to do with my upbringing on how it was. But like I put in that book, no one's going to come back and say, hey, man, I apologize. Maybe someone does. Very few people will. So at the end of the day, when all of these are said and done with, while my dad was the devil and I believed that for a long time, I had to, I had to confront him. And when I confronted the devil, so what I thought was the devil, I realized that I was the true devil. I was the one holding me back. I was the one looking for the scapegoat. And you know, I was the one looking for all these ways to say, it's okay, David. 
You're a loser. You're a born loser. So it's okay. And I was hoping my dad was going to give me that confirmation. And he was a loser himself. But at the end of the day, when I left there, I realized, well, man, it's on me. My dad's f***ed up. My mom's f***ed up. The people around me are f***ed up. They're not going to save you. You got to save yourself, my friend. So that's when all that reality hit me when I went to Buffalo to see my dad on that drive home. I was like, man, this rest of your life is going to suck. It is going to suck, not because you're going to be a loser, but because you're going to finally start to win. And winning is not easy, my friend. Rule number seven is boost your self-esteem. There are a lot of people that are listening right now that are either dealing with this very issue that we're talking about. When we finally left Buffalo, after all the physical and mental beatings that my dad handed out, mm -hmm. we left Buffalo and I went to a, to me, even worse environment. I went to a very small town in Brazil, Indiana, where there was about five black families. And in 1995, the KKK marched in our 4th of July parade. So that being said, it paints Brazil, Indiana, that, you know, that's the town I'm talking about, in a very bad light. Mm. And there are a lot of good people in this small town. So I want to make that very sure, clear. Sure. But what happens is when you come from a very broken foundation, yeah. your mind only sees hate and evil. Yeah. There was one time I was in my sophomore year, mm -hmm. walked in my Spanish class to get my notebook, opened my notebook up, and inside the notebook, someone drew a little character of me in a stick figure hanging from, you know, like that, like a noose. Yeah. Or like sure. a hangman game. At this time in my life, I was a sophomore and I had about a fourth grade reading level because I cheated all through school. Right. All through school I cheated because I realized I was going to get put in a special school. Right. So I found a way to get by and this is right. how I got by. Right. So what I'm getting at is all this between my stepfather getting murdered or soon to be stepfather getting murdered, all these things compounded into the lowest of low self-esteem. Mm. So what started happening was I started lying. I became an amazing liar because I wanted people to like me. Yeah. When you come from a society like I did, I had zero self-esteem and I feared things. I had zero self-confidence mm -hmm. and I was looking for anything I could yeah. that I could gravitate to. So it was lying. Yeah. But that's when I realized and it was a long process that without having self-esteem, mm -hmm. you are done. Yeah. That's the number one thing you have to have in your life. Right. Rule number eight is practice the one second decision. The one second decision is I had to live through that one second decision several times during this race. So this race took me a hundred and some hours. Okay. And this is what people don't get. For you to finish that race, even though I DNF'd, I still finished in the time. So there's a lot of pride in that. So what I do in that one second, because we all think about quitting when it's hard. But what you have to do in that one second is hard to process information during pain. Because that pain takes over and you can't think rationally. You're thinking about fight or flight, save yourself. That's not a rational thought. It's not a thought that's going to get you through hard times. Most people fail that one second. So what happens, what I do in that one second, it's a, and there's a bigger process to all this, but in that one second, I physically stayed in that water because if I get out of the water, I quit. So I physically stay in the water, but mentally, I'm on the beach with the instructors. And the instructors, it's cold outside, so they got these parkers on, they got their cup of Joe, and they're warm because they've already been through it. So now it's your turn to go through it. So mainly I get back with them. I'm still in the water physically, but mainly I'm back with them. I'm chilling. I got my parka on. And now I'm thinking logically because I'm warm now. Mentally, I'm warm. I've taken that one second. Let's not quit yet, Goggins. Let's think about your options. Where are you going to end up if you quit this? Where are you going to go? What are you going to say to yourself? Because you know you're going to get warm. The second you get out of this water, you're going to take a shower and you're going to be warm. And you could be, and in five days, you could be out. So I start thinking logically. I calm my brain down because your brain just wants to get the fuck out. Ring the bell, push your helmet down, get warm. And then you're really fucked. And these are the things you have to think about the one second decision. So that's what that's all about. It's about gaining control of your mind, putting things back in the proper perspective 
and then saying, I really do want to be here. And I'm going to have a bunch of these one seconds through this 130 hour journey. And I have to learn to control these because if I fail one of these one seconds, I will not be a seal. I will not be a doctor. I will not be a lawyer. I will not be whatever the fuck it is. So that's how important that one second decision is. It's all about your mind takes control of you. You have to say, fuck you, I run this. And that's what that's all about. Rule number nine is be with the right people. You talk about the importance of having the right people in the foxhole with you. How do you know who the right people are? You know what? That's, that was something that took me a lot of years to figure out. You know you're the right people in your foxhole. When you're waking up at three o'clock in the morning, you're going to bed at midnight, and you're waking up at three, and no one says, is this smart to do? You need some time off. You need to take a break. When I start hearing that shit, well, I know what I'm doing to myself. I was behind the power curve, man. When everybody starts off in first grade, I had them negative grades. I started off in the dungeon. Man. I, I had to dig out of the damn grave to get the first grade. So now when you're 20 years old, where everybody graduated high school and all sorts, sort of shit, man, I got to make time up. So while people think 24 hours is one day, for me it's three, four, five days. I got to make up time. I'm behind. I got to go to summer school in my mind. When a who's with me realizes this has got to go to summer school in his mind, he's got to make up time. He needs 22 hours of the 24. And they just get it. He's trying to go somewhere. You are the right person for my foxhole. I don't want to hear no shit about resting. I can't rest right now. I don't hear no shit about what I'm doing to myself. I know what I'm doing to myself. Did you see how I came up? I got to catch up now. And that's what life is about. Sometimes you are raised in a position where you are behind. We have to make that time up. I'm sorry. It may be inhumane. You may be unbalanced. It may not look right to you. I don't give a f It's the situation that life put me in. And I need people to say, when I don't want to give at three in the morning, I need a in my life that sees me go to bed at 12 and wakes me up at three. Saying you need to get this done. That's the foxhole. I don't need critiquing. I need pushing. I need pulling. I need anger. I need passion. I need drive. I need them, man, those bad days. I don't need somebody in my ear saying, man. Because then that's all a person needs is that. Support can go a lot of ways, man. It can go a lot of ways. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is don't give up. Let me ask you something. What does it mean to you to be referred to as the toughest guy in the world and to be called the gold standard and extraordinary and superhuman and all of these different descriptions of you that make it sound like you're a one-off, that it's almost unattainable uh, what you've done with your life. What does that mean to you in terms of your message? I mean, I guess the, you know, the, the whole hardest man in the world thing, um, that, you know, you can call it what you want, but that, that title came from where I came from. And, you know, it's like, you know, I had limited horizons. So if you were to have a million people in a room and you had all of their resumes, like from the age of one to the age of 20, you would never pick me being where I, you know, where I am now. And that's where the hardest man in the world came from was, you know, how many people can come from where this man started to where he is now? So it wasn't really so much about, yeah, all the physical feats, you know, going through, you know, still training three times and ranger school and all these things I've done that helped give me that title. But the biggest reason I got that title was because when I realized, you know, I was the fallback plan, I just refused to give up. And the thing about that, Chris, is like more, like I figured this out. Most of us are only one to 10% away from greatness. But we think we're so far away from it that we never try. And once I started going down this journey, I started realizing that, and those percents started to add up. And before I knew it, my mind started hardening and I started passing so many different people that I thought were so far above me. And then before I knew it, man, 
I became a common amongst the uncommon. And that's why I talk about the warrior mentality. Mm. And that's why so many people are lost when I start talking. You have the right. You're lucky that you don't have to think like warriors think. You're very privileged. I chose this world to be a warrior. And I would, and I would choose it again if I came back to this world. But the mentality of a warrior is very different than normal mentality. You must be that person on that door, oh, get ready to open it, thinking to yourself, if I die, so be it. The only way you can go in that door is knowing there's a great chance you're gonna die. Like being a SEAL, you train with live ammo. You jump out of an airplane, every, 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 everything you do, you could die. So to be a warrior, why people don't understand me, I'm glad you don't understand me. Merry Christmas, good on you. Because being a warrior takes a whole different mindset. A whole different mindset to know that there's a great chance I may not be in the military, like I was in for 21 years. I'm lucky. I'm very lucky that I'm alive, able to talk to you, able to still run. But when you sign up on that dial line to be a, like a SEAL, your mentality changes. I may not live. You gotta accept that. And that's the mentality you have. I was 300 pounds twice in my life. So every day I have my shoes laid out because I hate running. People don't believe it. <laughs> F you, I hate it. <laughs> so this is what happens. Every day I wake up out of my bed and there's my shoes, my shirt, my shorts, depending on the weather. There's some days I wake up and I just look at the for hours. And then I start walking around the house. And I say, I don't even run today. I'm not doing shit today. Nothing. I don't have to. I did all that shit. I don't need all this shit. I went through all this hell weeks and got my ass kicked all the time and made it. What am I doing this shit for? And that's when I think. I got 2.3 million followers on Instagram. It ain't about you anymore. It ain't about your ranger schools and getting beat as a kid. And you have an obligation, not to yourself, but to everybody out there that is touched by what you do as a human being. While nobody knows what I'm doing, no one is videoing me and shit, I am a virtual trainer mentally because there's a lot of people out there saying, man, David Goggins is getting after it today. And if I wake up one morning and don't do that, I go back to that David Goggins who lied about being who he wanted to be. So my thing that keeps me going every day is my mission in life, while I did not choose it, I'm an introvert and I hate what we're doing even right now, is to always stay the course. You man the up every day of your life because you know exactly what it is to not man up. I've done that too many times in my life. So that's what keeps me going. You have to tap into suffering every day of your life because we have so much scarring that we have to clean up. You have to look at suffering as almost like I look at failure. To succeed, you must fail. In failure and in suffering, all the answers are in there. All the answers to all the test questions, the test is your life. All the answers are in there. You don't have to live in suffering and pain and failure all the time. You have to learn, I need to visit it. Like people hate working out. You're only gonna visit working out maybe an hour a day. 23 other hours of the day, you're not in it. Mm. But how you become in shape is you must visit suffering, visit working out, one hour a day. Visit suffering one hour a day. Visit your past failures one hour a day. The relationship with it is the answers are in there. They, they are in there, within the suffering. Go in there, and I call it the live autopsy. The live autopsy, how you find out someone died, they crack you open after you're dead. How you can live is do it while you're alive. Go back in your brain, crack it open while you're alive. 
Don't wait until you're dead to figure out why you died. Do it while you are living. Go in there, go into the suffering. Go into the pain of your life and say, why did this suck for me so bad? Why am I afraid of all this stuff? Why have I shut down the whole world? I guarantee I'll tell you why you shut down the whole world. It's in these nooks of the suffering within your brain, in the scarring, are all the answers to why you are on the couch feeling sorry for yourself. They lie within the scars. Visit them for at least an hour a day, study them, and then you'll find out more about yourself. You will then grow. So don't look at it as every day I suffer. Go into it an hour a day. Learn from yourself, learn from life, learn from your failures, learn from your insecurities, learn from your self-doubt. Don't just say, I'm afraid to jump off an airplane. Mm -hmm. What makes you afraid of it? Study it. That's why I studied my mind, why I became so powerful in the mind, because I realized I was weak. So instead of running away from the mind, I dove into it and said, what is making me weak? So I get a lot of emails about how do I stay motivated, hungry, driven. Well, let me tell you something. Most days in life when I wake up, I'm not motivated, hungry, or driven. I have a commitment to myself, to the best version of myself. What most of us are looking for is a special fucking feeling of, oh, I feel great this morning. I'm gonna get out of bed and get a quick five miles in or go to the gym. If you're looking for that feeling, let me tell you one thing, it ain't gonna come. You have to learn to do when you don't wanna do. Learn to bring that savage mentality out of yourself. The animalistic motherfucker. You think a savage gives a fuck about how he feels or how she feels? They just do it. Learn to be your best self when you're least motivated. Stop looking for a feeling to control what goes on in your life. You have an obstacle to overcome, so overcome the motherfucker because of what's going on. What's your daily meditation or mantra or repetition to yourself? Every day I tell myself, I used to believe I was the weakest man that God ever created. So now I believe that I'm the hardest human being that God ever made. I don't care if it's true or not. It's the most important conversation to me. It's the thing that drives me every day. It, it, it's the one thing that keeps me going every day is that you must constantly be that man that you want to be. I saw these Navy SEALs before I became one. My God, they're better than me. Yeah. They're better than me. I gave up a hundred sets and I had to work up to realize these are human beings. Yeah. With the same shit I have. Yeah, there's some people who run faster, swim better, but mentality is mentality. Yeah. There's no, I, you're not gonna outwork me, mm -hmm. so I'm gonna catch up somewhere. Yep. So that being said, I used all that 300 pound man, that fat guy, that dumb guy. And people say, why do you say dumb? You have to be real yep. with you your be self. You gotta be wrong. If you're not smart, you're yep. dumb, yep. but you can become smart. Yep. You can become smart. It's not a permanent tag. Yeah. You're dumb forever. Yeah. You're fat forever. Yep. No, be raw. Don't find the cushy word. So before I start this journey being Navy SEAL, I go back to see my dad because I realize now I gotta fix some shit. I'm blaming everything. I gotta go back, you know how a lot of times you're like, if you're a runner, your, 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 your right knee may hurt, mm -hmm. but it's not your right knee that hurts, it's really your left hip. Yes. But we're concentrating on the right knee. Mm -hmm. I'm concentrating on all my shit, but I need to go back to the root of the problem, which is my dad. Mm -hmm. I gotta face the demon. Mm -hmm. I gotta go back and see what made him so up to make me so up, why am I up? Mm -hmm. So I go back and I, and I go back in as, a, as an older man now, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in my 20s, I'm not a kid anymore, and I want to see this man and face him as a, as a, as a grown man, but still as a kid in my head. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was still a kid, but I was a grown man mm -hmm. as, a, as my age. And I went back and I realized he was the same man that he was. Still the same. Still the same. And I talked to him, he was still nuts. And, um, I had, to, I, I, I had to go back and face that one more time, mm -hmm. but to face it in a different way. How'd you do it different? I looked at him in a way, we never said sorry to one another, and he went off about my mom and my grandparents and all kind of shit. But I looked at him in a way that I realize now why you fucked us up. Mm. I had to almost be him to realize it's okay, brother. Mm. It's okay, because I realized that somewhere in your life, something you up mm -hmm. and you didn't deal with it mm -hmm. and so you put that shit on me my mom and everybody around you i'm gonna deal with my shit. Mm -hmm. wow. so even though you gave me all this shit, mm -hmm. you you gave me a satchel of shit that i didn't deserve and now i'm all up and people think i'm a liar and i'm all 
The, you gave me this. You created this nightmare of Goggins. Mm. I'm gonna fix it though. Whenever times got hard, my right. mind said, you're not good enough. Right. Let's go. Right. So my mind wasn't, my, my eyes, my mind weren't connecting. Right. So how do you combat that? So how you combat that is this. I call it the cookie jar. Okay. You have to remind yourself. We all have a story. We've all, all of us have gone through very hard times. Mm -hmm. But when we're, when we're in a hard time, our mind has a way of forgetting what all we've overcome. Mm -hmm. I have a way of taking one second when I want to quit and saying, okay, you endured this. So I look at my life and how I came up as the ultimate training ground mm -hmm. versus most people look at it as why, woe is me, God, right. why, exactly. why? Right. I had to flip this upside down and say, hang on a second. God was training me to be one of the baddest men on the planet. That's absolutely right. That's how, mm. he, this, right. Was, this was my journey. When I was younger, life and society made this big world with all these endless possibilities. Yep. In this possibilities, my life made my possibilities this big. Yep. Because it made me afraid of all these different things. Yeah. So all this stuff trapped my mind, it shackled my brain, it made me a prisoner within my own self, saying, mm -hmm. this is all I can do. Because why? I'm afraid of this, I'm insecure over here, yeah. I got self-doubt over here, back behind me, good Lord, who knows what's behind me? I'm like, look behind me. So your life is this big. Versus it being like, I can do all this shit out here if I start to break down these ball, you know, these, these, these different walls and barriers. And that's what I started realizing. I could become a Navy SEAL. Mm -hmm. I could become this, but I was afraid of the water. Think about this. I know. Why the f are you going to go be a Navy SEAL when all you do is play in the water? Yeah. For, and we don't play. We're in it. And we're living in it. You're tying the, the ocean. ocean. You're swimming for That's miles. That's right. The ocean is unforgiving. Yep. Yeah. So my yeah, mind yeah. is, I'm going to go be a Navy SEAL. Yeah. If I didn't face that fear, no one would ever know me. I was number three behind Michelle Obama for a long time. Until my book sold out. Yeah. And I was a guy just 21 years ago yeah. who was 300 pounds, could barely read and write, mm -hmm. and now I have a book just... Two spots behind Michelle Obama. Yeah. Hopefully we, hopefully we get it above today. Right. Just because I was afraid. Yeah. But you overcome those fears, guess what happens? The whole world, you unlock this door and everything opens back up again. Whenever life would start getting good for me, God would throw a nice anchor mm -hmm. and stop me right there. Mm -hmm. So I'm going through pararescue training and there's this evolution called water confidence. Mm -hmm. And water confidence is pretty much what gets people kicked out of special, you know, special forces, special operations is the water. Mm -hmm. And they try to drown you, pretty much. <laughs> I, this was not in the warning order. So I didn't know anything about water confidence. Long story short, what it is is they put 16 pound weight belts on you, whatever they can do to make you uncomfortable in the water. So for six weeks of a 10 week program, I became very uncomfortable. We got down to about 25, 30 guys left. I was one of them. And getting near graduation of this program, I'm thinking, my God, I'm about to get through this. Mm -hmm. Barely though, water confidence is killing me. Right. They took me to medical, they, they, they drew my blood, and realized I have sickle cell. Yeah. So sickle cell is a blood disease that sure. some African Americans have, which is not good. No. So they took me out training for a week, and when you go from being uncomfortable, that's your lifestyle, you get used to being uncomfortable. Right. When you go back to being comfortable, your mind says, I don't want to go back to sure. being uncomfortable again. That's right. So I was like, I don't want to go back to the water. So my whole mindset was, I want to get out of this training. So I was hoping that they were going to medically disqualify me from pararescue program. That didn't happen. A week later, the doc called me in the office and said, hey, guess what, man? We're going to put you back in the training. I was like, okay, well, I missed a week. I got about two and a half weeks left. I can do this. I went back to the, you know, to the CEO, the command officer. He said, hey, guess what? We're going to start you back from day one. And when he said that to me, my mind went back to the old David Goggins. So yeah. I thought I had changed. Yeah. Learning, learning how to swim, learning how to read and write. Mm -hmm. All I was doing was attacking the surface. Mm -hmm. I wasn't getting down into the dungeon of what was really bothering me. So whenever like, like, tough times would happen, yep. any tough time that would, like really tough time that would happen, I would go back to the sewer of my mind. Mm -hmm. So this happened, I went back to lying. I said, hey, you know what, CEO? 
this guy, you know, the doc didn't know about sickle cell. He didn't give me a good reason why. He's talking about sudden death, heart attack, stroke. I'm not comfortable. So he gave me a medical from pararescue. So he allowed me to leave. Mm -hmm. But I, I really quit. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to go back in the water again. Right. And that's when I went from weighing 175 pounds to 297 in about oh, wow. three and a half years. Wow. So I did a job called TACP, yeah. controlling fast movers behind enemy lines. But that job wasn't a job that I wanted. Mm -hmm. And the spiral of depression, yeah. of trying to find things that I was comfortable doing. And whenever you find things that you're comfortable doing, you're going away from the journey of life. Mm -hmm. And I was going so far away from my journey yeah. that my weight showed my yeah. whole mindset. Yeah. If you're fat, and you look in the mirror and say, wow, I eat a little too much. No, you're fat. My exoskeleton is larger than yours. Right, no. <laughs> that's the new one, right? Yeah, that's, I mean, you, <laughs> you cannot say that to yourself. No. But see, you have to make a list yeah. of the things that you don't like to do. Mm -hmm. This list should be very long. Like, if you don't like making calls. Yeah. Yep. The very first thing you should do is start making a shit ton of calls. Yep. Because why? That begins to own you. Yes. You start to drive yourself this way versus this way. Yes. It, but you'll figure out if you start making a whole bunch of calls, if you like calling, call a lot. Yeah. Guess what happens? You get over it. You get over it. So what we do a lot is, I heard a lot of people say, triple down on this, triple down on mostly your strength. Yeah. No, 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 no. That works for a lot of things. But when you're afraid and you don't have the courage, mm -hmm. you have to triple down on your weaknesses yeah. and make that become where you start to guide yourself. Okay, I'm like calling, today I'm making 100 calls. Yeah. I'm gonna dial 100 times. We all have a voice in our head. Some of us are very spiritual, some of us are not, but we all have this voice saying, you're doing up shit. this is wrong, don't mm -hmm. do that. The more you don't listen to that voice, the further that voice gets away from your head. Some people call it the Holy Spirit, some people call it God, some monks, whatever, whatever you call it, it's yep. there. Mm -hmm. We all have it. Mm -hmm. It's the right or wrong voice. But the more we don't listen to it, the more that voice goes away. Mm -hmm. and the only voice you hear is yourself. Mm -hmm. all, when the only voice you hear is yourself, you're wrong. There's a voice that guides you through life. When sometimes it's guiding you in a direction that you don't want to go, mm -hmm. that's usually the right place to go. It's that uncomfortable place. So that voice is always talking to me, but we don't listen to it. I listen to it. I had literally, so we get scarred. And the thing about it is like, if you were in, a, in the kitchen and you're cutting up cucumbers, yep. you cut your finger. It happened 30 years ago. That scar is still there. They say, what happened to your finger? Yep. Guess what you do? I was in the kitchen one day, I was cutting up cucumbers, you know, cut my finger. Yep. You have those scars on your brain yeah. from life. Yep. But what we don't do is we try to hide those scars. We don't want to go back and revisit it. Mm -hmm. This is not as simple as a cucumber, you know, you know, cutting a cucumber. Mm -hmm. So I started realizing that my life was causing a whole bunch of scarring on my brain. And I had to go back, while I wrote this book, I had to go back and really break open that scar and let it bleed. Mm -hmm. And that was a very painful journey for me to go back. Cause you know, like right now this is all surface. Learning disability, call me nigger. Blah, blah. It's, it's, it's all surface. I sad, get deep sad into that it. A lot of people have dealt yes. with that stuff. Yeah, very right? sad. Yeah. But the way I talk about in the book, I'm, I'm getting your hand yeah. and I'm taking you back there with me. Yeah. As that kid in that classroom who opens up his Spanish notebook, I'm sitting in the back because I had a fourth grade reading level. I'm in the back, I open my Spanish notebook. On the first page, they had a hangman drawing of me saying, nigga, we're gonna kill you. Very back, I'm a sophomore in high school, nothing but white people. I shut that thing up and I leave class. My dad really helped create this. I'm not giving him credit. Yeah. Like, oh, he was a great dad. Like, clap my hands for his ass. Mm. He helped create this because he was just that, he was a, a devil. Mm. You know, he was a guy that had to be very insecure, very beat down. Something had to happen to him when he was yeah. younger because the, the way he treated me, my brother, my mom was just horrible. Mm. So he would beat us, my mom, my brother, my me. And I'm not talking about like, oh, you got in trouble, mm. so let me give you a whipping. Mm -hmm. when he, would, he was a drunk. Okay. So whenever he woke up, man, he woke up drinking, went to bed drinking, and mm. that's just how it was. And when he'd get drunk, he just got violent. Mm. My, so my mom caught my dad cheating. We got home about four o'clock in the morning. So I'm about seven, eight years old, and 
I hear some ruckus outside my room as I'm getting ready to bed down for the night. And my mom and dad are outside my room because there's a staircase right there. And my dad is smacking the hell out of my mom mm -hmm. and knocks her almost unconscious where she's kind of out of it. You know, she's kind of loopy. She falls down. He grabs her by her hair and drags her down the stairs by her hair. Mm -hmm. And so at this age, I'm sitting thinking, man, you know, what the fuck should I do, man? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I'm scared. But then something in me saying, you got to go and do something. Oh, my God. But I'm scared to death of this guy because he's been beating the shit out of me since I can remember. And I mean, like, laying me out for nothing. And I'm sitting thinking, man, okay, man, like, I, what am I going to do? So my brother, he and I were very different. When my brother would see the fighting, he would go to this room and hide. hide. Yeah. I didn't do that. No. I always stuck around. So this time I stuck around and I decided to help her out. So I go on the stairs and I jump on his back and literally he tells my mom, you're raising a gangster as she's like mm -hmm. on the floor. And he's, and he's almost smiling, almost like proud. But the, that smile went to a, a frown pretty quick and he mm -hmm. beat the living hell out of me. Mm -hmm. And he beat me literally from my neck down to my ankles, like black and blue. So the next morning, um, I was gonna go to school half the day. My mm -hmm. mom woke up and she pulled the covers back. And what she saw oh was how bruised I was. Mm -hmm. And so when she pulled the covers back and saw how bruised I was, I'll never forget looking at her face. Mm -hmm. Because she used to write letters for me, you know, for uh, me and my brother to miss PE mm -hmm. because we were so bruised up from getting beaten. Jeez. So, you know, hey, he's sick or yeah. whatever. And so, you know, she was lying a lot for my dad. So this particular day, she didn't write a letter. But when I laid in the bed and looked at my mom, when she pulled the covers back, I'll never forget looking at her face. Mm -hmm. And her face is tattooed in my brain. And why I say that, um, this past year, I got the VFW Award for Americanism Award. Mm -hmm. And if you Google David Goggins VFW Award, <clears throat> I'm in front of 5,000 veterans. And I'm getting this amazing award. John McCain got it. Mm. And I'm up here thinking, man, I'm up here getting this award. This is amazing. Mm. It's for giving back and also having a great military career. And I could give this six minute long speech. Mm. And I'm up there, man, I'm talking and I'm thinking, I'm thinking people who helped me out. And I get to my mom, she's sitting back, you know, she's sitting right here on stage, but behind me. And I haven't cried in 30 years. I can't even picture it. I haven't yeah. cried in 30 years, I don't do that. Mm -hmm. And I turn around and say, and I, you know, I wanna thank my mom for um, not picking me up when I was knocked down, but teaching me how to get up. Because mm -hmm. she never picked me up ever. Mm -hmm. And because her circumstances sucked. Yeah. So anyway, I look back and I said that, and when I got done, I didn't even get a chance to say it. Mm -hmm. I looked at her eyes and my head went right back to her face when she saw me bruised up. Mm -hmm. And that me up and for 58 seconds look at the video okay. and you'll see me my head's down and I'm sobbing wow and I'm in front of 5,000 vets and the wow. guy who was who was hosting the thing had to come up to me Whoa. and like put his hand on my back mm. and I was just destroyed mm. overcome with emotion mm. and then 58 seconds go by and I get up and I deliver this speech and so I tell you that because life my life tattooed me. I made thousand dollars a month, three hundred pounds. Just I can't do any of this stuff. Yeah. These people are better than me. Yeah. So the first thing is that's the first big problem right there. Mm -hmm. First big problem is that you have put a lot of people above you. Yeah. Put no one above you. Yeah. No one. Whatever. You, but if 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 you believe in something, say that again. Say that again, because that's. You know, but you know, but the, the man, the people that make more money, the people that are better looking, the ones that are on social media and they're so good at this. I put God above me. Besides that, there's no one better than me. Got it. You have to become an equal. Yeah. So this is how I look at it. If you're playing, and I talked about it at your conference, if you're playing Roger Federer, yeah. okay, be, be, before you get on the court with Roger Federer, he's the best of all time. Yeah. But you're also a professional tennis player, yep. man. Yep. You're forgetting your own resume. Yep. So once you get on the court, let's say it's a grand slam. Mm -hmm. It's five sets. Hopefully, yep. if you can go the distance with this yep. guy. Yep. But before you even bounce the ball to serve it, you're down two sets. Because why? You look across and you're playing Roger Federer. Yeah. But guess what? You hit a good shot on Roger Federer in the third set. And you realize, I can play with this but it's too late. Yeah. You gave up two sets before you got on the court. 
you got to stop giving up two sets before the game begins. And we do that already. We give up two sets before the game begins. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from Eric Thomas, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. So I'm working with the Cleveland Cavaliers. I'm talking about, I've been getting up at three o'clock in the morning. I'm putting videos out. I'm doing my thing. I never forget y'all. I never forget. So I looked at the best of the best motivational speakers.